Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Palestrant. As he just mentioned, I lead the business development function at Editas. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the company today. Over the course of our three-year history, we've raised over $250 million in two rounds of private and one public funding round. Hence, here is my public disclosure slide, which I will quickly pass through. Um, so what are we here for? There are 6,000 rare diseases with genetic, muta genetic mutations, and 95% of those have no approved treatments. With genome editing, we have the ability to get to the root cause of these genetic diseases to get to the DNA level. And this is what, what is the mission of Editas, which is really to translate the promise of these genomic editing uh, technologies into a broad class of novel therapeutics to treat patients. As I mentioned, the opportunity here is large. There are thousands of serious diseases for which there are potentially durable gene editing therapies. We are at a unique moment in time. We are able to understand the genome at a much greater level. We are able to interrogate the genome with these novel tools. And we are able to sequence patients to understand their disease-causing mutations. With this technology, we can now get at these root causes and, and create medicines to understand or to, to address these mutations. We're building the, the, this company to be able to pursue all of these, th these opportunities, which means that we're building a very broad platform. And I'll tell you more about that broad platform in the upcoming slides. We're also using a very, and I'll also mention the pipeline in upcoming slides as well. We're also using a very selective and deliberate, deliberate business development strategy to really have focused collaborations that we think will accelerate and advance particular programs in our pipeline. And I'll also tell you more about those in some upcoming slides. And finally, I mentioned the very strong financial base that we've built for the company. Um, that allows us to have the financial flexibility to go big, to go broad, to build that platform for the, broad, for the long term. And again, you'll see in our pipeline, it will include near-term opportunities, but also more difficult but very important and compelling um, compelling indications where we think that genome editing therapeutics have an opportunity to make a really large impact. Finally, on the foundation, I've already mentioned the financial foundation. I'll also highlight the team. We have an amazing set of founders who, we, who stay very engaged with the company. And I'll also highlight just a couple of new recent additions to the team, um, such as Charlie Albright, who just joined us from BMS. He's our chief scientific officer and Jerry Cox, who just joined us from Santa Fe Genzyme as our chief medical officer. So let me explain a little bit about the technology. CRISPR-Cas9 is a ribonucleic protein complex. It consists of the Cas9 protein and the guide RNA. The guide RNA is shown here on the right in the orange and yellow <coughs> figure. It functions as a two-part mechanism First, the Cas9 protein identifies a PAM in the genomic sequence, and then the, and the guide RNA, those, that guide sequence in the dark orange, recognizes the adjacent base pairs, or the bases next to the PAM sequence, and lays down that sequence. If you have the match of the PAM and the guide sequence, the Cas9 protein creates a cut. So really, the, as I mentioned, the, the Cas9 protein confers approximately three base pairs, of recognition sequence, the guide RNA about 20 base pairs. And that happens, that ability is about one in every 10 base pairs of the genome. You can target the genome. Following the cut, once the, the base is um, hybridized, the Cas9 creates the cut. Following the cut, the Cas9, or the, the cell's natural repair mechanisms take over. And so really there are two classes of repair mechanisms at a high level, um, non-homologous end joining shown on the far left in the center of the slide, and homology director repair shown on the far, far right of the slide. I'll start with the left, the cut and revise. When Cas9 creates a single cut in the DNA, the cell's natural repair mechanisms take over and usually insert or delete a small handful of base pairs. And as a result, it disrupts the translation of the gene and usually effectively creates a knockout. The center panel, the cut and remove panel, is, is when you take two cuts of the DNA and actually excise a piece of DNA. We're doing this in our LCA10 program. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, or I'll mention it later. But essentially, in the LCA10 program, there's a mutation that creates an aberrant splice site. 
And by removing the aberrant splice site, you now allow the protein to appropriately translate and you get res restoration of the wild type protein. And on the right side, the cut and replace, this is a much more difficult um, a mechanism in the cell to, to direct the cell to do, homology-directed repair. In essence, you would be cutting out a mutant piece of DNA and replacing it with the wild-type form. And we're working very hard internally to shift the balance, to understand that balance towards that homology-directed repair. As I mentioned, we think there is a plethora of opportunity there and a very important need to explore this area. So I'll briefly touch on the four pieces of our platform. We think all of these pieces are important to creating a genomic medicine. So first, the nuclease engineering region, or nuclease engineering piece, which is in the top right. Um, this is where we can um, access a number of tools of both Cas9 enzymes as well as guide RNAs, where we can um, work with our nuclease engineering team to expand the opportunity of, of Cas9, the genomic editing, as well as efficacy and specificity. We have a number of Cas9s in our toolbox, including the Strut Pyogenes Cas9, the Staph aureus Cas9, and a number of new novel PAM sequence Cas9s that we've in-licensed from MGH. I'll touch on that in a moment. On the bottom right of the slide, you see the delivery component. At Editas, we are agnostic to the delivery. We are going to use the delivery that best gets us to the tissue and cell type that we want to address an indication. What that means is that in our toolbox, we have the opportunity to work across AAVs, lipid nanoparticles, electroporation, and again, we'll optimize the right modality to get to the tissue type with the exposure that we're looking for. On the bottom left of the slide is control and specificity. We believe that understanding the exposure of the cells to the Cas9 CRISPR system is incredibly important, and this is where we think about things like self-limiting Cas9, self-regulating Cas9, as well as tissue-specific promoters. And the top left, directed ev editing, I've already mentioned this. This is understanding if you're doing non-homologous end joining or homology-directed repair and the balance. And we think, as I mentioned, that all four of these components are incredibly important to creating an, a, a genome editing medicine. So for example, in the LCA10 program, we're using the shorter Cas9, the Staph aureus Cas9, plus two guide RNAs with their promoters packaged into a single AAV vector delivered with an injection, injection to the eye subretinally. I also briefly mentioned some new PAM variants of Cas9 that we recently in licensed from um, Keith Jung's lab at the Mass General Hospital. What this effectively does is it allows us to double the amount of DNA, genomic targets in the DNA by not restricting to that original PAM sequence. So here is our pipeline, here are the areas we work in. You can see it's very diverse, both in tissue and in delivery modality, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But first, let me touch on how we choose a disease to work on, an indication to work on, what are our guiding principles. First, the medical need. We think it's important to work where it's important to create a genome editing um, medicine where there's no other treatment available. And we also want to ensure that there's an opportunity to create a durable impact with the work, with the the um, therapy that we, we provide, something that's going to be a very unique and differentiated benefit. Second, the clinical and biology path. We need to have a clear biological hypothesis for the genomic intervention and understand that the fix that we're going to make is going to have a clinically relevant impact. And also understand the regulatory clinical path, and that includes things like trial design and endpoints. And finally, technical feasibility. This touches on ensuring that we have an understanding of the delivery path, how are we going to get the CRISPR-Cas9 to the right place, as well as understanding that it is a technically feasible mutation to fix based on the things I talked about earlier, like non-homology end joining, non-homologous end joining and homology directed repair. So in the next couple of, of slides, I'm going to touch on a little bit of data. What I do want to highlight is while there's only a little bit of data here, we do present regularly at scientific conferences, and I'll direct you to our website where we put all of that material up. It's available and it's updated regularly. The work I'll talk about first will come from our Juno collaboration, and here our focus with the Juno collaboration is really to improve T-cell persistence and overcome the tumor microenvironment. 
And as you can see in the box, we add our editing reagents at the same time that Juno puts in their cars into the system. So here we've generated some high efficiency guide RNAs that cut at a very optimal level. Um, as you see here on the left side of the slide, we're screening a number of guide RNAs using, using a functional screen. Here we're looking at fax readouts. So you're looking for PD-1 negative by fax. And then you can see on the right side, we've optimized these to over 90% cutting efficiency. And this includes in the presence of the car. We've been able to translate a lot of the learnings to HSCs. So we work in HSCs, and one of the major um, important things to ensure when you work with HSCs is that you, remain the multi you, you maintain the multipotencies of these cells. So I'm going to show you on the next slide uh, a few pieces of data here, and I'll walk you through it. So on the far left of the slide here, we're showing just editing in HSCs. This is across approximately 20 donors both in cord blood and, and mobilized peripheral blood. And the readout here is by sequencing. So you see about 50% editing in both cord and mobilized peripheral blood. In the middle of the slide, we've now put those cells back into mice and shown long-term engraftment of those cells. They've been able to repopulate the bone marrow at over 80%. And then finally, we can show that those cells maintain their multipotency and are able, and this is on the right side of the slide, to differentiate into all the cell lineages. So I'll briefly touch on our, our business development strategy here. Um, this is a partnering meeting. We really look to focus and, and collaborate early with partners that really bring unique capabilities and insights. We, we follow a few guiding principles. The first is really we partner with folks that we think will really accelerate things in our pipeline or increase the probability of success of things moving in our pipeline. And alternatively, we'll partner with people who are, expand the breadth of what we're working on and bring unique capabilities in new areas. So I'll highlight three partnerships here. The Juno collaboration, which I showed you some data on a, few, a couple of slides ago. And this, again, is focused very, um, very much on engineered T cells and oncology. And here, this is an area we couldn't have done alone, yet we think we provide a lot of value to, um, to their medicines, and we think that the technology will really be differentiating. Our partnership with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is really, again, about accessing their broad disease expertise. They have an amazing network of scientific advisors and key opinion leaders, and being able to access those for our cystic fibrosis program is incredibly important. And recently, we've announced the, the um, collaboration with Adverum, again, focused on really something that we think can advance the technology. They have, very, they have novel advanced AAV technologies, as well as a lot of ocular gene therapy expertise, and we'd like to leverage both of those. And that really is the ability to leverage those in up to five, exclusively in up to five ocular programs. So I'll touch briefly on our intellectual property estate. We have a very broad intellectual property estate of over 350, 350 pending applications. And that includes both in-license patents as well as internally generated patents, patent applications. And those also cover our platform as well as particular therapeutic areas. We also hold 29 issued US and European patents, which include the broad claims covering the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in eukaryotic cells. And important, it's, it's important to know that our patent portfolio consists of multiple strategic layers. I already mentioned how we think it's important that many of these layers will stack up to make any particular drug. But I'd like to end with where I started, which is I hope you, you've learned here a little bit more about why Editas exists, which is really to translate this amazing technology into durable therapies for patients. Our goal is to build a long-term successful company that can create important medicines for patients very broadly. This is what is core to Editas. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions afterwards, or else I'm going to get the hook. <laughs>